Okay, great. So thank you very much, and let me thank uh, Albert for organizing this. This is a great group of macro and micro people, and so uh, a lot to learn. Uh, this is a paper, again, with a number of my colleagues, at least with uh, Diego Restucia, I think who a lot of you know, uh, with Tassa, who was one of uh, Diego's students, and also with Jessica Light. Jessica is a fairly recent PhD uh, who's now at Williams. Let me just begin just a little bit in terms of kind of the big picture, in terms of what kind of motivates uh, the kind of work that we're doing here. I mean, I think we all know that when we take a look in terms of differences across countries, differences between rich and poor, that one of the things that's underlying those differences is just huge productivity differences, again, across these countries. But we've also, I think, become a lot more sensitive to the fact, you know, in part because of the work of, of Rogerson and, and Diego and others, that resource allocation is just extremely important. I mean, how efficiently resources are allocated, again, in these countries uh, is extremely important, again, to these productivity differences that we uh, happen to, to observe. At the same time, that when we take a look at differences, again, between rich and poor countries, one of the reasons that countries tend to be poor is because of what's going on with agriculture. That agricultural productivity tends to be extremely low. There's a high percentage of people that are in the agricultural sector exactly because productivity is low. So agriculture, productivity in agriculture is extremely, again, important part of any kind of story of development that we want to tell. But at the same time, just as resource allocation or misallocation is important to explaining differences kind of at the aggregate level, it's also going to be true in agriculture as well. And so we have a keen sense now from the work of Diego and others that resource misallocation in the agricultural sector uh, is, an extremely, is extremely pervasive. It's also extremely uh, important uh, in terms of contributing to productivity differences. And that moreover, that this misallocation that we observe in terms of the agricultural sector, much of it again seems to be related to the way in which land markets work and to distortions again in land markets. Well, in this paper, what we're going to be interested in doing is kind of taking a look in the agricultural sector in terms of how important land and land allocation happens to be, again, in terms of um, productivity in the agricultural sector. And so one of the things that we're going to try to persuade you, is, at least in the context of China, is that not only is it the case that agriculture land or that land and agriculture is misallocated rather poorly, but it's also going to be the case that it's not going to, well, it's going to be the case that some households are, going to, in fact, going to be penalized in some sense even more because, again, of the problems in terms of the, the, the misallocation that we happen to observe. And that in particular is that insofar as that there's frictions, again, in this land market in the agricultural sector, so in terms of how this farmland is being allocated across these households, that what we're going to at least try to demonstrate, again, empirically in turn look, look at the consequences is that it appears to be the case that more productive farmers are, in fact, are going to be more adversely affected again, by these land market frictions that we happen to be observing. So these land market frictions are going to affect everybody, but we're going to show, again, that they, in fact, affect more productive farmers even more. And so that what this suggests, then, that when we're interested in looking at the effect that these kind of land market imperfections happen to have on kind of aggregate agricultural productivity, there's going to be two kinds of margins that are going to be important. On the one hand, the fact that this land market doesn't work particularly well and land doesn't get allocated to the most uh, productive or efficient of farmers, it's just simply going to affect the allocation of resources across farmers, which is just kind of the traditional kind of misallocation uh, that we might see again, uh, again in the agricultural sector. But what we're also going to see is that it's going to be influencing the kinds of individuals who decide to stick around and farm in agriculture. And that insofar as that I happen to be a really productive farmer, insofar as the cost of these frictions or distortions are in fact higher, that what it's going to do is it's going to influence choices that individuals and households are going to be making about what they want to do. So if I happen to be a really productive farmer, if I'm a productive farmer, what I want to be able to do is to kind of expand, again, kind of the size of my operations. But if I can't do so because the land market doesn't work particularly well, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide again, or possibly decide, to go ahead and to do something else. And so that margin is going to be extremely, again, important in terms of who's in agriculture, who's outside. It's going to have implications for productivity in agriculture, productivity out, outside. So it's going to have potentially important implications, again, for productivity not only in agriculture, but also uh, in non-agriculture as well. And so kind of the key insight, again, of this paper is that this selection mechanism or this selection effect is going to amplify the kind of the traditional kind of misallocation effect that we may observe uh, because of um, uh, the fact that these land markets don't work particularly well. But it's also the case that insofar as that selection happens to be present, that insofar as it's influencing the choices that individuals are going to be making, that it's also going to be affecting the, the productivity distribution 
and our measured misallocation. So in other words, that if all the more productive of farmers are deciding that because of these uh, constraints that they're facing, if they decide to go out and to do something else and to move out of non-agriculture, that what it's going to do, it's actually going to reduce the dispersion of productivity, again, of those individuals who actually remain in agriculture. So if we just measured misallocation on the basis of those individuals that were in agriculture, again, in this kind of setting, it would actually might suggest that misallocation is less of an issue than what, it, in fact, it actually is. And in fact, again, it's being concealed in part because of this selection kind of mechanism uh, that we're going to, to talk about. Well, why take a look again at China? I think there's all kinds of reasons to take a look at China in terms of this particular context. Certainly, it's an economy that we know that over the course of the last 30 or 35 years has grown very rapidly. And we've also observed, and as we've heard in a number of papers today, just a lot of sectoral reallocation, a lot of movement of people out of ag to non-ag, people from rural to urban. But it's also the case that more generally, and these things are always kind of sensitive to, to how you measure these things, that at least if we were to take a look at productivity, kind of some kind of measure of the productivity gap between a non-ag and between ag, that in general, that over most of the 30 years, that there hasn't been much in the way of improvement, again, in terms of, this, uh, in terms of the productivity, uh, in terms of non-ag to ag. What we would expect is that, and certainly in the context of other countries, is that as people are moving out of agriculture, we'd actually expect productivity in the agricultural sector perhaps to be growing or increasing more rapidly uh, than what it is in non-agriculture. And at least in the case of China, this gap, again, has remained uh, relatively constant. It's also going to be a setting in which where average farm size, certainly by comparison you know, to those of us, at least in North America, farms are relatively small. So the average farm size is only about 7 tenths of a hectare, not much more than about two acres. So these farms, again, on average, uh, are going to be relatively small. But it's also a setting, and again, this is going to, I think, an important institution. It's also a setting in which property rights, again, that households happen to enjoy with respect to land uh, are relatively undefined or at least not as well-defined as one might like. And so at least in the Chinese setting, the ownership rights to land, they don't reside with the individuals, but rather they reside with the villages or the collectives in which they happen to reside. Their claim to land is tied to the fact that their hukou or their registration happens to be in these villages. As long as my hukou registration is in that village, in principle, I should be entitled again to a claim again to that land again that happens to be uh, in, these, in the village. And that, in general, households are allocated these rights on a relatively egalitarian basis. So just imagine taking the total amount of land that happens to be in a village. I'm going to divide it again by the number of people whose registration happens to be in the village. And that's going to determine, again, what the endowment is of any individual in that village. And for the most part, that does a reasonable good job in terms of explaining kind of the, the endowments that households happen to, to enjoy. But what we've seen, and this is certainly over the period that we're going to be taking a look at, although there's been changes over the course of the last 10 years, is that certainly over this period, rental markets are, in fact, relatively thin. We don't see an awful lot of rental, again, between households over this period of time, or at least certainly not more arm's length kinds of, of rental. And in fact, there's a literature, again, out there that tries to explain, again, why these rental markets might be thin. And so one of the early concerns was is that of what we often would refer to as is use it or lose it rules. So that if you happen to be, again, in a village, if you weren't farming your land, that because, or you weren't using your land yourself, that because these villages would occasionally reallocate their land amongst all the households that happen to be in the village, that can't come the time of the reallocation that you ran the risk of losing it. So that the village would actually take that land away from you and give it to somebody else if you weren't using it. So that there were all kinds of, you know, there are papers again that have been done that have suggested that households didn't want to rent their land out because again, by doing so, they might risk uh, losing it again uh, come the next reallocation. Well, also in terms of China, why we're going to take a look at China, well, we, we're going to take advantage of a, a unique panel data set of households uh, that has been collected since the uh, mid to late 1980s by the Research Center for Rural Economy. It's going to provide us very detailed information on the farmers' outputs and inputs, as well as on their non-agricultural wages. And that what these data are going to allow us to do, given that we have very good information on inputs and outputs for these households for what they're doing in ag, what they're doing in non-ag, is that we're going to be able to go ahead and to take a look and try to identify, again, this selection across, sec across sectors, so these choices that these households are going to be making between ag and non-ag, and we're going to be able then to use that and try to link it to uh, the misallocation that we happen to uh, observe. 
Uh, in terms then of, of what we're going to do in this paper, the first thing is relatively standard. We're going to take advantage again of this panel data and a fairly standard framework, quantitative framework that comes out of this misallocation literature. First of all, to try to document just the extent of the misallocation that we happen to observe, both within villages, across villages, and over time. So for those of you, again, who are kind of familiar with, you know, Chang, you know, with Shed and Cleno, not much different, again, than that work, uh, only here it's going to be in an agricultural setting. We're also going to be interested, then, in trying to take a look in the kinds of gains that could be realized in terms of total factor productivity if we could move to a more efficient allocation. So if we could eliminate, again, these distortions that may exist within village, between villages, what would be the kinds of gains that we could realize or that could be realized in terms of productivity and output in these villages from just, again, eliminating uh, these kinds of wedges that might exist? The other thing that we're going to do, at least take, using the panel data, is that we're going to go ahead and we're going to construct at the farm or the household level these measures of these farm level distortions that households are going to be facing. And so these measures, again, of, of at least farm level distortions are going to be, again, unique to the household. So we can estimate these things for each and every household. So that earlier that when I talked about, again, the potential effect, again, of, of the, uh, either the misallocation or the problems in the land markets, we're going to be able to see, again, the extent to which, again, these problems, again, are or how they happen to be related to the productivity uh, of individual farmers. The second thing that we're going to do, and this is in some sense, I think, where the contribution, I think, is the, I think the most more important contribution uh, of the paper, is that what we're going to do, then, is to estimate uh, a two-sector general equilibrium model where we're going to allow, now, individuals to be making choices in terms of what they're going to be doing. So that we're going to allow there to be heterogeneity, uh, in terms of ability uh, across individuals, and then in terms across sectors. So sec individuals that are going to be making choices kind of in light of uh, their abilities in terms of whether to work in ag relative to work in not ag. And that what we're going to do is that we're going to use, again, this model, along with the information that we happen to have, again, in the panel, to be able to estimate kind of critical population uh, parameters from the observed moments in the data. So for all of these households, we're going to know exactly what they're doing, ag and non-ag. We're going to have information on those individuals and households that are moving out of non-ag. We're going to be able to use that information then to be able to recover, again, some critical population moments. All right? And then kind of the key moment, again, at least in terms of the data, is going to be this correlation of, of the income of the switchers across sectors. But once we've gone ahead and we've had then been able to kind of recover the population moments from uh, the actual uh, obs from the from data that we have, we're going to use that then to try to take a look at the impact uh, that these distortions happen to have then on the occupational choices that individuals are making, the selection, and the uh, aggr aggregate agricultural TFP. So it's kind of the combination, all of those things, both in terms of being able to kind of measure the extent of the misallocation, trying to construct these farm level measures, again, of these distortions, and then combining that information on the farm level distortions in the context of this two sector model to try to take a look again at the impact that these distortions are having on occupational choices and productivity uh, in the agricultural sector. What do we find? Well, the first thing, again, that we're going to find, and this is just in terms of the empirics, is that there's an enormous amount of misallocation that we happen to observe with respect to land and capital, even at the village level. So we're going to be looking, again, at the misallocation for the entire rural sector, but we can certainly, we're also going to do a lot of this at the village level. And that if we could go ahead and if we could eliminate, again, these distortions and these wedges that exist, again, in these markets, then the output gains, again, from eliminating the misallocation are about 80%. Now, again, the, if we were to go ahead and as, if we were to use, again, a measure of household productivity that was, in fact, kind of the average of the uh, household productivity over the entire period for which we have data, then the gains would be a little bit lower. They're going to be about 65%, 70%. But the basic point here is that, first of all, that these gains from eliminating this misallocation uh, that exists, again, in these villages, first of all, is extremely high. But what's also interesting is that we don't see much in the way of changes over time. So that insofar as that this misallocation related to how land markets are working and capital markets, insofar as that there's problems, again, in these markets, there's certainly no sense in which, empirically, at least over the period that we're going to be looking at, that things are going to be getting any better. But it's also the case that we're going to see substantial variation across provinces. In fact, there's huge differences, again, ac across provinces, and differences, again, that in some sense aren't, um, again, the reasons for aren't uh, immediately uh, obvious. 
The second thing, again, the third thing that we're going to find is that these distortions that we happen to be uh, estimating, so these farm level distortions, are going to be systematically correlated with the farmer's productivity. And that in particular, that these distortions, again, that these households are going to be facing, that more productive farmers are in fact going to be facing larger distortions. That the distortions, again, with respect to how the land and capital markets happen to be working, again, these are the individuals or households that are going to be facing uh, these things that are going to be facing, the, the, for whom the distortions are in fact going to be largest. Last is that what we're going to see, again, taking advantage, again, of, that, uh, of the general equilibrium model, is that if we could go ahead and if we could eliminate the correlation that exists between these distortions and ability, right, so that insofar as that these distortions are systematically and positively correlated with how good of a farmer you uh, happen to be, is that you could go ahead and that you could improve agricultural productivity by 74% just through the improved selection that you're getting, again, in terms of the choices that these individuals uh, are making. And so this is going to be significantly, again, larger than just what I would refer to as the static gains. So if you just simply eliminated that correlation between productivity and between the magnitude of these distortions, but didn't allow it to affect, again, the individual's occupational choice, the gains that you would get would only be 24%. So what this is suggesting, again, in the literature, again, certainly in the Lakatos and Wall, where they talk about the amplification effect, here, again, we're getting an amplification effect. So the effect, again, of selection, again, on productivity, an amplification effect of, on the order of about three. So it's a relatively large amplification effect that's coming through, again, uh, the way in which these distortions are affecting the uh, occupational choices and, and productivity. Now, there's a, certainly an extensive literature, again, out there. I think most of you are familiar with these. And in the interest of time, I'll just skip that. Certainly a, a literature uh, in the context of China that has gone ahead and kind of looked at some of these issues, either about agriculture, or about land, or problems of, of misallocation. So let me just kind of take just a, a few minutes just to kind of talk about the framework for measuring, again, the, the misallocation. So here we're going to have a, a Lucas span of control agricultural economy in which the economy is going to consist of a, a number of villages that are just going to be indexed by V. Each of these villages is going to be endowed with a certain amount uh, of land. There's going to be a certain number of farm operators in each of these villages. There's going to be a certain amount of capital that's going to be in the economy that in principle could be mobile across uh, villages. And that we're going to allow now these farmers to also to go ahead and to differ uh, in terms of uh, their productivity. And so SVI is just going to be the productivity of uh, household or farmer I in, in village V. So we're going to model productivity, again, pr uh, at least uh, the production, again, in agriculture in a fairly standard way, where in this case, this parameter gamma can either be interpreted as a span of control uh, parameter or just as the, the extent of decreasing returns in terms of the managerial abilities uh, of the farmer. But what we can do is that in a fairly standard way, we can go ahead and Given that we happen to have this economy where there's a certain endowments of land and capital and farmers, again, of certain particular levels of ability, that what we can do is that we can go ahead and we can define, again, through looking at the planner's problem, uh, what the efficient allocation uh, would be. And so that's kind of what the planner's problem uh, would effectively be. We can go ahead and we can solve what the planner's problem would be. And so here we're going to break the, pro the planner's problems into two sub-problems. Uh, First of all, kind of the optimal allocation of K across villages, and then conditional on that, the optimal allocation, again, of, of village-level resources, K and L, across, again, these households within a village. So we can go and we can solve the, the planner's problem. But what we get out of the planner's problem, and I'm just going to skip here, is that what we can do is that we can get these measures, at least, of these potential efficiency gains you know, of the reallocation. And so there's going to be three that are going to be critical, again, for, the, for our purposes is that the first is that if we could just go ahead and if we could eliminate any kind of misallocation within a village, so that if we could go ahead and we could reallocate the capital and the land in the village across these farmers, again, in an efficient way, again, based on their productivity, then we can go ahead and then we can first of all kind of estimate what the gains would be to eliminating the within village, again, distortions. The second thing that we can do is that now suppose that capital was mobile, again, across these villages, well, we can do the exact same thing. We can also go ahead and take a look then in terms of what would be the efficient uh, allocation in that particular case and what output would be if labor and capital, again, in this particular case, were allocated uh, efficiently. The final thing that we can do 
is that although we can't move land, so land is in some sense fixed, imagine that we could go and that we could move farmers. So imagine that farmers, so each and every household happens to be endowed with a certain level uh, of productivity. Well, suppose now that we could go and we could move farmers. And suppose that we could move farmers and we can move K as well. Well, that's going to be what we're going to refer to as this kind of eliminating nationwide misallocation. All right, so here land again is fixed, but we're going to be able to move farmers. So in this case, farmers are going to be able to move again uh, across villages as well capital. So that would be a kind of a third, that would be kind of eliminating what we're going to refer to as eliminating nationwide misallocation. We can also, again, it's kind of standard, again, in the literature, we can calculate and kind of measure these various kinds of idiosyncratic distortions that farmers are going to be facing within village distortions. So farmers are going to be facing distortions with respect to the land market, with respect to capital. There's also going to be, again, across village distortions as well relating to the allocation of capital. And so, again, it's kind of standard, again, in this misallocation literature that what we can do is that from the first order conditions, we can go ahead and we can back all of these things out, which is what we're going to need to, need to be able to do. Now, in terms of the data that we're going to be taking advantage of, is that here we're going to take advantage of the household survey data uh, from the Research Center for the Rural Economy. And so this is a survey that actually began in about 1986. Uh, it continues again on to this day. We have at least the data up to about 2002. Um, we begin in 1993, and it's just because of measurement issue, that certain things that are our ability to be able to measure farm output at constant prices, well, it's not until 1993 that they began to provide the kind of disaggregated information that we needed to be able to measure, again, farm output, again, for all of these households at a constant set of prices across the entire sample. So we have household data for uh, 10 provinces. We have an unbalanced panel for about 8,000 households from about 110 villages. So we have somewhere on the order of 70 to 75 uh, households per village. That certainly on the income side, we're going to have detailed information uh, on the income that these households are earning from uh, each of the sectors that they happen to be involved in. And for agriculture, what's critical is that we have data on outputs, inputs, and prices all at the farm level. Right? And so that information, again, becomes critical to what we're going to be able to, to do. In terms of our farm level uh, measures, we can go ahead and we can construct a measure of gross real output. And this is going to be just a measure of farm output, again, at the household level, where we're going to use a common set of prices, again, to be able to value the uh, output uh, of these households. We can do the same thing with respect to the household's intermediate uh, inputs in agriculture, which is primarily going to be fertilizer and pesticides. We can construct real value added. We have estimates of land. We also, again, have estimates, again, of capital uh, on the basis of the, primarily of farm machinery and equipment uh, and also draft animals that are used in agriculture. Well, what about these land market institutions uh, in the context of China? Uh, as I said kind of at the outset, what households are allocated are use rights over the farmland. And so that when the responsibility system was originally introduced, households in principle were supposed to be given the use rights to these land uh, for a period of 15 years. In the late 1990s, uh, these rights were extended for a period uh, of up to 30 years. The ownership rights, however, don't reside with the households, but rather they reside with the collective uh, or the village. And that the allocation, at least, of these use rights that households enjoy is really based on the individual's registration, or HUCO, and is typically done on a fairly egalitarian basis. What we also observe, again, that although households were allocated these use rights for a period, at least initially, that was supposed to be for 15 years and later for 30 years, what we observe is that the reallocation of land amongst households within these villages is something that in lots of villages has in fact been very common. So that though in principle I've been allocated land, I'm supposed to enjoy those rights for a period of 15 years, now again 30 years, that what's happened is that households or villages for a variety of reasons again would frequently decide to kind of reallocate that land uh, amongst these households and thus individuals endowments and, and, uh, and rights again would effectively either be lost or, or would change. Um, it's also important, again, in the context of China, this land can't be used as, as collateral. Uh, households, in principle, have the right to rent or transfer these use rights uh, to other households. But certainly up to the period that we've been taking a look at, you don't see an awful lot. That the amount of rental, the amount to which households happen to be kind of renting uh, land to other households, that this is, again, uh, relatively rare. It's, again, it's not all that common. And so the land market here is, is relatively thin. Again, we just don't see much in the way of reallocation 
through rental, rental markets to households. And so there's this kind of frequent claims that households have made over the years over use it or lose it rules. And in fact, there's a literature out there looking at these issues about migration and migration decisions on the part of households and trying to link household decisions with respect to migration to these use it or lose it rules. So John Giles, for example, has a number of papers trying to take a look at this kind of connection and the intuition being if you're concerned again about losing your land, then what you may do is you may return, you may either not migrate or you may return to your village uh, as a way to try to secure your claim to the land. Um, just in terms of kind of measuring kind of the farm level uh, TFP, again, kind of fairly standard here in terms of we're going to do it. We're going to, here we're going to make some assumptions again about what these underlying parameters are that are going to allow us to be able to calculate what farm level uh, productivity is. We could also, and we're giving serious thought to actually being able to estimating again the underlying production technology uh, using the input and output data that we have and so that rather than again imposing again these kinds of assumptions we could actually estimate it um, more in a more sophisticated kind of control function kind of way to get perhaps slightly better estimates again of TFP uh, at the household level. If you take a look at household farm level TFP, here's just the dispersion uh, in farm TFP. And so that you can see here that the kind of the 90-10 ratio is somewhere on the order of about six. Uh, the 75-25 ratio is somewhere on the order of about two. And so that this kind of dispersion, although it looks to be relatively large, uh, it's actually relatively small, certainly by comparison to what we observe uh, in manufacturing. So in Chang Tai's work and Peter's work, where you look at the dispersion and productivity within sectors, Again, much larger than what we happen to, uh, to observe, at least in the case of agriculture. And that certainly the dispersion that we're finding with respect to TFP uh, in, these Chinese, in the Chinese agricultural sector is certainly much less than what one would observe in the US. And Diego has more recently found, again, in the case of, of Malawi. Here we have, again, a simple scatter in terms of factor allocation by TFP. And this is, in some sense, I think you can kind of see what's going on. You know, if, in fact, we thought that land markets, capital markets work reasonably well, that what we would expect is that we would expect to see then a positive correlation between the amount of land that a household happens to be using and their TFP. We would expect the same thing, again, with respect to capital and TFP as well. So we'd expect you know, these things, again, to be positively sloped as land, again, and capital are being allocated, again, to those households, again, who happen to be the most productive. Certainly in the case of land, certainly not much in the way of an indication to suggest that that's true, again, by any means of the imagination. And capital actually seems to kind of be the, the opposite. So here you can just see through this very simple scatter that it certainly doesn't look as if you know, land and capital are being allocated, again, to these farms and households that happen to be uh, the most productive. And so what we do then is that we take advantage, again, of the data that we can actually go and we can estimate then what the efficiency gains if we could go ahead and we could reallocate again, these factors and eliminate the wedges that exist both in the land market as well as uh, in, the, uh, in the capital market. Certainly, so that in terms of, kind of in terms of our baseline here, that if we could go ahead and if we could eliminate these, these mis the misallocation just simply within the villages. So we could go ahead, how many more? Two. Two. We could go ahead and we could eliminate within. These are the kinds of gains that we could go and get. So gains on the order of about 40%. If we could go ahead and we could do it both within and across about 60%, Finally, this is what you can see that what we could do, again, nationwide. So huge gains. Again, if we could eliminate that misallocation, here you can see in terms of the kinds of gains that we could get if we could eliminate them uh, in terms of over time. Certainly no sense in which they've declined. In fact, they kind of, uh, kind of decline again in 1998. They're rising. They decline during the Asia financial crisis, and they start to rise again. That's exactly right. I just, I'm, in this particular case, well, I have to take TFP simply as given in this particular case. Well, I do it two ways. So that when we, we certainly we go ahead and that we've measured, again, all of this reallocation where I use, again, a household's farm level TFP, again, in any particular year. I've also gone ahead and that I've used, again, a measure of household farm level TFP where it happens to be the average, again, of household TFP over the entire period. It doesn't, again, make any difference, again, in terms of either the magnitudes or what we happen to be observing here, again, in this particular case. Well, you could, but we're also going to allow, though, I mean, at least that distributional parameter, I mean, the degree of the decreasing returns to scale. We're going to make an assumption about what that is, and that's going to be factored in in terms of the productivity as well, right? So that when you go in and when you do the counterfactual here, 
that whatever you believe that span of control parameter is, is going to be factored in in terms of what the gains are going to be to reallocating the land. So that's already implicitly being incorporated. Now, maybe there's better estimates, again, of whatever that gamma happens to be. I only have about one minute, two minutes, and this is in some sense probably the most important part of the paper. Uh, it's, again, what we're trying to do here is that we're trying to integrate what we have. Thank you. <laughs> we're trying to, again, integrate, again, what we observe on the misallocation side and on the selection side, because the intuition is, is that insofar as that there's misallocation, again, with respect to land and capital, that it's going to be affecting, again, the nature of the choices that households uh, are going to be making. And so Diego and Tasso, again, have gone ahead and kind of worked all of this out, developed, again, the model. We can get these idio measures of idiosyncratic distortions, again, in agriculture. So income in agriculture, non-ag, income. Assumptions, again, about the going to be critical parameters, correlation, again, of abilities across sectors, preferences, farm income, correlated distortions in agriculture. And then again, typical kind of Roy model where there's going to be an occupational choice that households are going to be making again in light of their productivity, in light of these distortions. We're going to be able to calibrate this thing on the basis again of the observed moments, back out these population parameters. And so again, it's a bit complicated in terms of backing these things out, but they were certainly successful in doing this. And so these are the, on the right hand, are the observed moments that we actually observe in the data. On the left are the population parameters, again, that we're able to solve for then that become critical. But let me, here's the, I think in some sense, the, the critical kind of table. If we could go ahead in this particular case, kind of the counterfactual experiment, is that suppose that we could go ahead and we could eliminate the correlation of ability and distortions. So when we take a look at those distortions, again, that we happen to observe, is that there's two kinds of dimensions. Those distortions that are going to be systematically correlated with an individual's productivity. And so that what we observed, again, is that those more productive farmers, the distortions were larger. Well, even, again, for farmers of any given level of ability or productivity, there's going to be differences in distortions, again, as well. What we're going to do is we're just going to shut down only one of those kinds of distortions, namely those distortions that are correlated uh, with an individual farmer's productivity. And that what you can see here, that just what it means, both in terms of productivity in agriculture, in terms of structural transformation, again, the results, again, are fairly huge. That if you could go ahead and you could just eliminate, again, those kinds of distortions, you can see the effect that it's going to have on real productivity. It's going to increase it, again, by about 70%. You can see the effect that it's going to be having, again, on the percentage of the population that happens to be working in agriculture. You can also see, again, what it's going to be having, again, to non-ag productivity and in terms of the ability of those individuals that are ag and non-ag uh, as well. Um, now, I, one last slide is that the other thing that we've also been able to do, and I think it's an important question, is that what would be the distributive implications? So here again, that if we could go ahead and if we could eliminate these distortions that happen to exist in terms of these land rental markets, suppose that we could more efficiently allocate it. What would it mean in terms of the distribution of income for households in these villages? And so what we've been able to do then is to go back and just assuming now that you eliminate these distortions, is to go back and to recalculate now what household incomes again would be in a world in which we've eliminated these distortions. Now, what you would see is that, first of all, there's going to be an enormous amount of reallocation of land between households with those more productive farmers now getting a lot more land. But what's also true is it's also going to have a big implication in terms of what the returns to land are, what the rental rate on land would be, and what the returns would be to households who now could possibly rent their land rather than farming it themselves. And what's important is that when you take a look in terms of the distributive implications, is that it would actually turn out that those individuals who are in the bottom quartile would, in fact, that if you eliminated these distortions, that these individuals on the bottom quartile, they would, in fact, be better off in an environment in which you eliminated these distortions and they were able to rent this land out than they would, again, in an environment where these distortions existed. So one of the rationales that's often given for this kind of policy, in terms of the, the restrictions on what households could do, again, with this land, it was often, again, about concerns about distribution. Well, what these exercises, again, are suggesting is that there may be no trade-off as well. That what you could do, again, to, by improving these property rights, not only could you improve, again, the efficiency with which land is being allocated, and thus with all these kinds of gains that we've talked about, there's no sense at all that there'd be any distributional consequences. And in fact, those individuals who are on the bottom, 
might actually be better off, or in fact the numbers are suggesting they would be better off and be one of the, would in fact gain most, again, from these kinds of uh, reforms, again, that might help to improve uh, the property rights that households enjoy. Thank you. So, shall we move to the discussion? Okay, thank you very much to have me uh, review this amazing paper. I, I, I really enjoyed it as, you know, uh, as you know, uh, this paper is uh, basically on the distortions in agriculture sector, which is uh, uh, relatively attracts you know, uh, less attention uh, compared with the manufacturing and the service sectors. So uh, it is uh, particularly important in the context of current China that the government, you know, uh, tries to you know solve the imbalanced economic growth. Uh, economic growth between agriculture and non-agriculture sectors, and there is uh, there has been a loud voices on the reforming, uh, you know, on the land market. So basically, this paper deals with the distortions uh, uh, in land and capital, which leads to factor mismallocation and inefficient selection of workers, uh, uh, occupation, occupation selection of workers, and further resulting substantial, you know, output or productive productivity losses. Uh, and the, uh, 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 the collaboration uh, results by that, you know, this distortion uh, are account for about 84% of uh, productivity loss, which actually struck me a little bit. So this is actually has a strong, uh, you know, uh, policy implications. If it's true, uh, the government should contribute much to eliminate uh, these distortions. Uh, or to you know speed up the reform, and uh, uh, the authors tried to you know uh, uh, model uh, the resource uh, misallocation uh, into the, uh, the part across farms within families uh, within uh, villages and the part across villages. Okay, and the individual uh, face occupational choices between working in agriculture or non-agriculture sectors, and uh, you know uh, the author also pointed out that the farm specific distortions are the key determinants of the occupation choices. So if uh, I understand right. Um, so now let me talk about some uh, concerns about the uh, modeling part uh, or just uh, some confusions. Okay. Uh, so uh, the author models the uh, agricultural sector uh, production as uh, uh, like the basic unit is the production is a family farm with one farmer. So I'm wondering whether you know uh, uh, it is uh, possible to incorporate the uh, labor use in the production uh, function, because uh, based on the th uh, thinking that uh, usually uh, one family has uh, more than one family members. Actually, the family uh, faced with the uh, the uh, the optimization problem, deciding uh, the proportion of uh, family members to move out or stay on the agriculture uh, production. So I believe that you know the uh, labor input uh, has some you know uh, effects on the production, and uh, this is also deals with the problem of, of occupation selection that is modeled in the later part of the paper. And the second is about the modeling distortions and uh, uh, the farm specific distortions uh, uh, is introduced into the model as, this, uh, as a form of land and uh, capital taxes as similar in Xie and Kalano uh, in 2009 paper and uh, I was just thinking hard, what is the specific form of distortions? So uh, as pointed out in the paper, the land distortions include you know, the lack of property rights and no choice of optimal land size, and capital distortions may be you know, related to inflation allocation of machinery and uh, equipment. But I'm, I'm just trying hard to link you know, this specific form of distortions and you know, the, uh, you know, the tax rates. Especially in the later parts of the paper, the uh, authors, uh, you know, uh, assume that these tax revenue are returned to the individuals equally. So I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I find it hard to link, you know, the fixed form and the the assumption of tax, uh, the the, uh, the introduction of uh, the distortions. 
And the last uh, part is, uh, point is about the occupation choices. So the authors try to argue that the determinants of the occupation choices is from specific distortions. Uh, and uh, the, the, it seems that they draw a conclusion that elim eliminating such distortions would make more productive individuals return to agricultural production. I was just thinking, what is the basic reason for you know, the migration from rural uh, areas to urban areas. I think uh, there, there might be other factors influencing the decision. One important uh, influence uh, factor is the income or wage difference between these two areas, right? So uh, I, I remember that there, there's kind of uh, return uh, migrants in, uh, in about 2005 and six, and uh, due to the low wages in the uh, urban areas. So I'm thinking actually, uh, uh, is this true if we eliminate the, the distortions, the farm specific distortions, the, uh, pre, the more productive uh, you know, uh, people will go back to the, uh, to the farming? I think it is uh, reluctant for uh, some uh, people, especially the young generations, to go back for, you know, for farming, especially you know, like uh, 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 crops uh, you know, cultivation. So uh, I think that this uh, uh, dichotomy between rural and urban areas you know, results in the fact that most productive family members potentially uh, uh, migrate to urban areas, which is likely to have uh, further exacerbated the misallocation. So my key point is that maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, make the model more richer and more realistic if you know, incorporating uh, the labor part, especially you know, s some institutional uh, you know, factors uh, uh, of labor uh, into the model. So thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Um, so, uh, one comment I had is that by modeling this as a static distortion, uh, this last part about selection seems like it might overstate the gains from reallocation to the extent that um, people, when they're making a decision, if it's a career decision to leave agriculture and go to the city, they're not going to be factoring just the current productivity difference, but the projected growth and productivity differences over time and as you gain experience in urban areas. And so it may still be rational in a dynamic sense to leave agriculture even when the current productivity in agriculture is higher. So thinking about relaxing those assumptions about a purely static kind of decision might change uh, that calculation. Uh, uh, just a very minor comment, you know, that, you know, it, every time when we think about some immobile goods, you know, we have to be very careful in terms of, you know, this mislocation issue. I understand, although you cannot move land, you can move farmers, but moving a person from a, from Delta River to Yellow River, I don't think, you know, you know, this is so easy to, to do it. So maybe the counterfactual part of the national wide part probably should be uh, taken care, you know, you know, with more caution there. This paper seems to suggest that uh, the productivity level in agriculture are low because of the distortion uh, in China. But if I draw a parallel between China and India, uh, the productivity level in agriculture sector in India is also very low. But we don't have the kind of distortion which China has. I mean, in India, you can lease out your uh, land, you can uh, sell your land. So you have, proper, uh, you have uh, pr property right. So despite the absence of this distortion, I wonder why the productivity level is so low. So if we take any clue from India, uh, I doubt that if we remove this kind of distortion, it will lead to increase uh, in, increase in 84% increase in efficiency. So I would like to uh, listen something from you about this parallel. I'm, I'm struck by those um, scattergrams that you showed with land capital and uh, and efficiency and and I wonder if you've 
if you could do something like that, say for uh, the United States or or for one of the uh, Western European countries that have uh, very efficient, low, uh, small agricultural sectors, like, I mean, may, maybe you get a correlation between capital and uh, capital allocating efficiency, but I doubt whether you get it with respect to land. You know, for example, I mean, I don't know, I haven't seen any data like that, but the, the closest I can think of is, um, is wineries and the, their efficiency in producing wines. And, and I vaguely remember Orly Aschenfelter telling me of what explains the quality of the wines and uh, size of land just doesn't come into it at all. <laughs> you know, you could have a big winery producing in, in, inefficiently and, and a small one producing the super uh, quality ones. Uh, let me just take these in a variety of orders. Albert, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the choice is dynamic. Trying to go ahead and to put down a dynamic model and to deal with this is a lot more complicated. Just solving again as the first, the static model, I think was a real achievement. I think we'd like to be able to do a dynamic. I'm just not sure and what that's going to entail, but I think your point is extremely well taken. In terms of people moving in agriculture, in fact, that what you see, there's a lot of cases of where farmers are moving between provinces. So for example, if you go to Jiangsu, you go to Zhejiang, and you take a look in terms of who happens to be doing the farming these days, certainly in Jiangsu, you'll see a lot of people coming from Anhui and from interior, again, provinces again, that are moving where land, again, is being freed up, again, in a variety of ways. So it does, again, happen. How much of the land, again, is being farmed by people who have moved, again, in that way? I can't tell you. But so, I, <laughs> point well taken, but it's not as silly. I don't think, this, the counterfactual isn't as silly of an exercise as perhaps at what it might, in terms of what it might seem. All right, so, but again, your point is well taken. In terms of productivity of land, I mean, I don't know much about India, but here to me is a, and a good indication of how severe the inefficiency, at least in terms of land is. I saw some numbers recently in terms of what the subsidies are for agriculture for the grain sector. And so for the grain sector, the subsidies, reported subsidies are somewhere on the order of about 3% of GDP. So that's, these are the subsidies that are going to the grain sector. The grain sector is about half of the agricultural sector. The agricultural sector is about 12% of GDP. So that means then that the subsidies, again, to the grain sector are probably about half of value added <laughs> in the grain sector. This is huge. And so in fact, I think these subsidies, that the enormous subsidies that we're seeing again to things like the grain sector are in fact a product of these enormous inefficiencies that we've observed. And this is why again, all these reforms that we're seeing now with respect to agriculture, trying to reorganize agriculture in a variety of ways, is just a realization that there's an enormous amount of inefficiency. So again, I, I'd be curious to see, I'd like to see someone do the exact same thing for India because my gut is, is that although there's rental, there's other kinds of restrictions, again, in terms of in India that may be impeding the rational kind of organization, again, of farms and farm size in India that may also be, again, contributing to the same kind of thing. So, but I think, again, your point is well taken. Scatter diagrams. Um, I think that Diego has gone ahead, at least at one point, looked at this in the context of the U.S. And so that when you see in the United States that both in terms of the allocation of land and capital, Again, you see, again, that those positively sloped lines, as you would expect. I mean, Europe, I can't tell you. My sense is, is that it probably looks a lot like, 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 what, we, like what we see there. Um, in term, yeah. In terms of the comments, again, thanks for your comments. Labor input is, in fact, there. We just didn't talk about it. Uh, in, and, in fact, in terms of the, all of the estimation, everything, again, has been normalized by the amount of labor input that households are, in fact, using. So... Labor input, again, is implicitly there in terms of all of the, the estimation, at least in terms of this draft, it just hasn't been made as explicit, and that it's clear, again, that the inefficiencies that we are observing, again, aren't related, again, to, to as much, again, to, to land. Um, in this paper here, again, we're looking at choice, occupational choices, again. The only way that we could do it, again, in this version is to look at it at the household level. The RCRE data do not allow us to go ahead and to take a look at individual choices between ag and non-ag. So all what we're able to do is we're able to like, take a look at the household level and their choices between non-ag and ag. And so that's where, again, these things, these moments, again, are being identified off. 
I think TASO has kind of worked out what we would need to be able to do in terms of being it, doing that at the individual level and what the relationship would be these, between these moments at the household and the individual. Uh, John Giles and I, probably about 10 years ago, did a supplementary survey with RCRE where we actually collected individual level data. And so one of the things that we're working on now is to try to get a better sense in terms of these choices at the, within households between ag and non-ag so that we can, in fact, maybe move this to an individual level rather than, so that there's individual selection going on as in addition to the household selection that's going on. So I think your point is extremely. Uh, what data are? What data are? The individual, so what they did is that after John and I worked with them in terms of designing, again, a survey that allowed them to collect individual level information, moving forward then is that they incorporated as part of their regular survey, again, those individual level data. So in discussions with them to work with them, again, to try to get data from the 2003 up to 2014, that would allow us to go ahead and to extend. So this paper is certainly in terms of China, it's economic history. So it only goes to 2002, 2003, and lots of the in really interesting things, again, are happening uh, now. The other thing, again, I think a point that you had alluded to is that right now is that in terms of these choices that we're allowing, again, the distortion in agriculture to differ, again, across households, again, and to be correlated with productivity. There are also likely wedges, again, that exist uh, for households in terms of moving into non-agriculture. And so the other thing that we've been also working on now is to try to go ahead and to allow now there to be wedges that households face in terms of moving to non-ag activity, allow those to differ, and it would be a much richer, again, model that we could go ahead and that we could estimate as well. So that there's not only, again, these distortions that households face in agriculture that may be correlated with productivity, but there could also, again, be these wedges in terms of their movement from ag to non-ag that may also differ, again, depending on productivity. So that's just, again, one more dimension. It gets a little bit more complicated, but we've started to kind of work that out, and I think it's an important uh, way to go. And it will help to kind of link some of what we're doing here, again, with even some of the migration kind of literature where these migration decisions could be important. So, but the comments, again, all well taken and, and, and very good. Um, so we're going to close today's, uh, the first day of the conference. Uh, thanks to all the speakers and discussion. I think it was a really great discussion today. Um, <laughs>